Yet a she clebinali dashigine, Torch in Shabashish tin, I could net dash and ela shima, a beatha chi auto, beatha chi dash che, Dithagin de nasha auto, Kinflanisha hoan. My name is clebinali. Currently, I live in Flagstaff, Arizona, originally from Black Mesa, and I'm an organizer with Tullahoan Info Shop and indigenousaction.org. The history of police and policing in the so-called United States is important to understand in its initial inception as uh, enforcement of the, the, the interests, the economics of slavery and the interests of slave owners uh, against black folks. So it's uh, established an anti-blackness to uphold the economy of slavery. Uh, but you have to also recognize that um, policing and the enforcement of settler colonial, uh, settler invader laws um, were really a practice of many uh, entities, um, not just like formalized law enforcement entities, but military entities or just uh, individual invaders or uh, settlers who would uh, come in and enforce uh, the perceived laws, whether it's the do doctrine of discovery um, and manifest destiny uh, and other laws that were established that were anti-indigenous, anti-black, um, to uh, establish uh, the settler colonialism uh, and resource colonialism as well. So um, the, the history actually of the slave patrols just goes back to the 1700s, um, but we see the dynamic of uh, policing and enforcement of uh, these uh, invaders' laws as something that's established in the initial waves, uh, even before the establishment of the so-called U.S. Uh, with um, the invasions of the um, uh, the Arawak lands in the so-called Caribbean with uh, Columbus and his uh, uh, violent, murderous forces. Uh, and you see that um, what they were motivated by um, certainly was established with the, the doctrine of discovery of the, the papal bulls, um, sort of giving license and uh, establishing this impetus to go out and to conquer these lands uh, and claim them uh, and, and really, you know, wage genocide. So, you know, the, the, the violence of uh, settler colonialism has been enacted by many agents uh, that represent not only the state, but this sort of uh, idea or idealism uh, of colonialism, uh, which is heavily rooted in capitalism. So in the so-called Southwest, we have one of the highest populations of indigenous folks. Uh, these so-called border towns, and I don't like to use the terminology border towns because the city of Flagstaff, for example, is occupied stolen lands. We have 13 indigenous nations that hold wholly the San Francisco peaks, which this settlement, this in, in, invading settlement uh, is, was established right at the base of. And so uh, currently we're addressing a crisis of uh, racial profiling uh, and targeted policing of indigenous communities where uh, in a town of about 70,000 people, we have on average six or so, uh, six to 8,000 arrests uh, per year. Uh, and if we look at the annual police reports, half of those arrests are indigenous people, even though we only make up 10% of the population. So that amounts to one in every two native people uh, facing risk of arrest, regardless of age. Uh, in this community. And that statistic is actually worse in some of the other outlying so-called border towns like Winslow, where L'Oreal Sinigini was gunned down by Austin Shipley, a white police officer uh, um, for allegedly shoplifting. Um, and those statistics uh, are also present in uh, other so-called border towns like Gallup, Farmington as well. So in the outlying um, areas around the reservation boundaries, uh, these, these um, uh, internment camp, concentration camp boundaries, um, uh, we have these uh, 
extraordinary examples of targeted policing of indigenous folks. And the implications are that um, we continue to face uh, the, the reality that these laws uh, and, and the ways that these laws are enforced were never uh, set up to serve indigenous people. Um, historically in Flagstaff, uh, indigenous folks have been invisibilized, we've been disposed of, we've been made um, uh, to be discarded uh, by uh, white supremacist settler society. Uh, because we don't benefit this society and our existence is a constant reminder of um, the, the history and the blood that uh, is on the hands of the establishment of this colony. And that is perpetuated through the violence against our sacred sites and the ongoing violence uh, against women as well uh, with missing and murdered indigenous women, which law enforcement play a critical role uh, in, in, in perpetuating as well. So it's important to recognize that those statistics are one thing but the reality and the implications are that, you know, our, our relatives on the street, unsheltered uh, or um, just being uh, a, a, a brown or even a black person uh, here in this society is, is that there's an antagonistic relationship that targets us because of that disposability, because of the relationship that we have had historically and how it's rooted in settler colonialism uh, and the violence that is exacted is the violence perpetuated through these agencies. It's important to recognize the geopolitics of resource colonialism and resource colonialism basically differentiating that between settler colonialism and settler colonialism is where the uh, um, invading forces will um, uh, dispossess indigenous folks, indigenous populations, uh, and dispossession can look like genocide um, uh, for the purpose of settling those lands. Resource colonialism isn't necessarily complete dis dispossession. It could be um, dominating, controlling, subjugating those populations to extract whatever resources, but the indigenous res um, population still maintaining um, a position on those, on those lands. Um, uh, and the settler colonial society outside of that benefiting and prospering. Uh, so in terms of resource extraction, resource colonialism, what we face is um, the police are always the front line protecting those corporate interests or private interests that are waging violence against Mother Earth and inflicting trauma uh, through whether it's coal mining, whether it's uranium mining, whether it's fracking for natural gas, whether it's gold, whether it's oil uh, extraction, or whether it's even um, a recreational commodification of the natural environment, which is a form of extractive uh, uh, violence against the land. Um, and that's exhibited through places like Arizona Snow Bowl ski area operating on the holy San Francisco peaks here. Uh, they're a ski area that has been resisted for many generations because of the sanctity of this mountain. It's holy to 13 indigenous nations. It's a critical uh, environmental uh, site as well. But the ski area has expanded and they have most controversially been able, been permitted and sanctioned by the U.S. Forest Service who maintains that land as public land and by the city of Flagstaff who maintains a contract to sell 180 million gallons of treated sewage to spray on that mountain for the purposes of snowmaking because in the face of climate change, uh, these uh, industries insanely want to supplement the natural weather that we don't have uh, by making snow out of sewage um, pumped through a 14.8 mile pipeline uphill. And so we've been fighting this, um, but what we see, of course, is that the courts, um, we fought this in, in the courts, we fought this administratively, we fought this in, in various forms, uh, and they've constant, the courts have constantly failed us because these laws were never set up to serve indigenous interests. Um, these laws are established, they're premised, or they're predicated uh, on the, the severing of indigenous people's ties to the land, and that in and of itself is a form of direct genocide, but it's also ongoing cultural genocide because these sacred sites that are, are, are extraordinarily important for our survival as indigenous people, our existence as indigenous people, um, these laws aren't set up to serve that. And so what 
Uh, we see, of course, is through enforcing those laws, the police are at the front line protecting those private interests, protecting those economic interests, protecting those co corporations. When we stand up for our cultural survival, when we stand up for our existence, and we, we, we dare to fight back when these um, courts and these systems have, have failed us. Uh, and so myself, I've gone to jail uh, many times over this. Uh, I've faced um, trespassing charges for simply praying up on this holy site. Um, I face disorderly conduct charges for chaining myself to, to bulldozers along with many of my friends and accomplices uh, in this struggle to protect this sacred mountain. But every step of the way we face the threat of armed thugs uh, that are protecting state interests or federal, federal interests or these uh, economic interests uh, above uh, those of our survival as indigenous people. And so this is the dynamic that we face. And this is not um, an exception. This is an example of the reality that uh, is, it's a microcosm of the reality that we face any time we stand up to protect our mother earth on our terms as indigenous people. When we want to pr practice basically our, our ways of life, just praying um, and protect those ways of life for our future generations and honor uh, the, the work, the voices, the spirit of our ancestors. So this has happened at Mount Graham. Uh, which is a sacred site in, in southern so-called Arizona. This has happened at South Mountain. Uh, this has happened in Mauna Kea. This, is, this has happened in Standing Rock at um, uh, Lake Oahe. This has happened at so many other sacred, sacred places where they really are the physio-spiritual front line in the fight for our survival, our existence, not just culturally, but physically as indigenous people. Uh, the police are always there at the front line enforcing these laws, these, these invaders laws, um, and perpetuating violence against our people on a long-term basis for, for future generations. And this is also, the violence of the land is violence against people because the land holds trauma. Our identity, our way of life, our existence is directly intertwined uh, and deeply connected uh, to the land. We can't separate it. There's no dichotomy between spirit and nature for our way of life as indigenous people. It's one and the same. And the, 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 these court systems, these laws, uh, these, these, the, the police who enforce those laws don't understand it on those terms. They're only serving their interests. And those interests were never designed to serve us. There's a lot of folks who say honor the treaties, but they've never actually read the treaties. And if you look at the treaties, there's a lot of um, uh, most most treaties that I've read, particularly the Treaty of 1868 for Diné folks or Navajo people in this area, uh, very much was established to uh, control indigenous populations first and foremost to to settle um, and cease warfare. Uh, but uh, it, they, these treaties are on the terms uh, of duress of uh, indigenous folks. Guns were to um, the heads of appointed leaders, in many cases these puppets that were designated, and sometimes it was just those who, who, who stood up and fought on, on behalf of the peoples and the land. But in any event, uh, the, the reality is, is that if you look at the terms of those treaties, um, they were set up to police indigenous folks and to control um, who was on the res, who was off the res, allow um, uh, folks uh, to be on or off the res, uh, and restrict that uh, access as well. And so um, they set up uh, police agents um, on the res based upon our treaty uh, and um, enforce that. And so the, the, the terms of the treaties uh, were really terms that weren't established to uh, further uh, and, and empower indigenous autonomy as actually to subjugate and control it. So um, from that point on, you have to understand that, that that's deeply part of the histor historical relationship. And it, it was initially a military uh, relationship and engagement uh, and settlement. And then we have to look at um, the result of that and how that plays out on reservations today because the, 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 the constitutions that tribes have adopted, the structures of governments mirror uh, the U.S. government. And that's by no accident. Uh, the Navajo Nation Tribal Council was set up in 1923 for the sole purpose of extracting resources uh, from our lands. Uh, and so any uh, arrangement politically 
you have to understand then was occurring on those terms. So the interests, of course, were not to benefit the indigenous people, but to benefit um, those uh, the, the the settler uh, or the resource. Uh, the, the relationship of resource colonialism. And so uh, the enforcement happens on those terms. Enforcement is established within a constitution that the Navajo Nation has adopted based on that. The enforcement is established in most, uh, I think the, the best example is when we look at the so-called Navajo land dispute that was established in 1974 by the uh, U.S. Congress in a law called PL 93-531, which is the, the so-called Navajo Relocation, Navajo Relocation Act which divided our people, separated Navajo Hopi land, um, and forced the removal of more than 20,000 uh, Diné folks from our ancestral homelands. But today, there are still families, elders, uh, who are resisting this forced relocation. Um, it's been a 40 plus year battle where they have effectively resisted all the U.S. power, the U.S. might, all their policing forces, which have been exacted upon them. Uh, elders have been brutalized. Elders have been uh, arrested uh, for ceremonies. Ceremonies have been desecrated uh, up in this area, but they continue to resist. They continue to stand up against that. Uh, and it's interesting because we see multiple jurisdictions sometimes come out and address uh, the enforcement of these uh, laws. Uh, sometimes it is tribal police. Sometimes the tribal police don't have um, the capacity to address these issues. So if there's uh, like a, a foreigner out who's a non-tribal uh, member who commits a, a, um, an act of violence on the reservation, sometimes those uh, the law enforcement agents won't actually enforce the laws against them. And this is where missing and murdered indigenous women uh, is a critical issue that needs to be addressed when it comes down to policing as well. because. Many times people know that they can uh, commit a law on a reservation uh, and then they won't be prosecuted for that. Not to say that that would result in protection for indigenous women, but recognize that they see uh, vulnerability and they capitalize or they exploit that. Uh, and that kind of violence is precipitated uh, by the system that wasn't obviously set up to protect indigenous women, protect indigenous lands, protect indigenous people at all. Um, so that's part of the failure and clear example and demonstration of that. Um, and so uh, what we see is uh, if, there's a, if there's a federal crime that's committed or a, a felony or an extreme crime committed on the reservations, um, then it becomes a federal offense and it, it, it uh, is treated differently. And so sometimes there's a question of uh, how the jurisdictions work together. I know on the Navajo Nation, they have compacts, they have memorandums of agreements and understandings uh, as well. But you have to understand first and foremost that reservations in, in, in indigenous uh, nations, um, or the, I should say the tribal governments are puppet governments. Uh, they were propped up and established um, as proxy uh, um, uh, 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 entities uh, to settler colonial, colonial um, powers. And so uh, sovereignty has never really been defined. What we have are domestic dependent nations that um, ultimately at the end of the day, the laws are enforced um, uh, and, and upheld in the interests of that settler colonial ident uh, entity as a whole. So if we look at the history of tribal gaming, for example, where some, some tribes were like, hey, we want to set up our own casinos or we want to set up our he hemp farm. Uh, we want to set up something uh, independent uh, that uh, maybe the state laws prohibit or the federal laws prohibit, but because we're sovereign nations, we should be able to do so. Or we can even look at um, traditional fishing uh, and the fishing rights and the, those fights in the, the so-called Pacific Northwest. We can look at the uh, tobacco wars uh, in Mohawk territory uh, as well in some of these areas. And we see what happens is when, when indigenous nations want to um, enact and uphold and, and, and practice their self-determination, uh, we see state entities, we see federal entities um, uh, unleash uh, the, 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 the state violence against them. And so this is part of the dynamic, part of the challenges that we face. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, it plays out in different ways um, uh, in a range of different reservation communities. We have more than, in the so-called U.S., we have more than 565 so-called federally recognized indigenous nations, and it's complex. I think there's a lot of interesting ways that the 
concept of decolonization is being applied today. Um, and it's for the most part a buzzword that it's like one of those words that you say over and over again until it loses meaning. Um, if we look at the terms of decolonization in Africa, you know, where um, Fanon was exploring and in, 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 in analyzing and actually part of those movements, or you look at the terms of decolonization in other places, it means war. Uh, and that's the reality. Um, so, you know, in terms of who's going to enforce and protect settler colonial interests, um, you know, this is conflict. Uh, and, and we have casualties within that. You know, we have to look at this, this so-called criminal justice system that exists in the U.S. being statistically globally um, the, the largest incarcerator in the world of folks. You know, we can see why we have Red Fawn. We can see why we have um, Leonard Peltiers. We can see why we have so many other unnamed indigenous uh, folks who have been kidnapped, who are um, political prisoners that are held um, because of because they are indigenous, because they have answered the call uh, to protect Mother Earth, or because they are living uh, and being who they are. You can't de decolonize the police. You can't decolonize policing. You can't decolonize the prison system. It must be abolished if we're talking about uh, an actual decolonial or anti-colonial approach to addressing uh, the, the ultimate systems of oppression that the police represent. Uh, so so, so it's, it's, it's intrinsic uh, upon our approaches. Uh, if we claim any uh, you know, sense of decolonial or restoration of... Um, uh, the indigenous uh, and assertion of in indigenous ways of being uh, with Mother Earth uh, in, in, in being free and uh, with our integrity uh, in our uh, existence, then, yeah, there's no way we can reconcile the existence of policing, the police state uh, and uh, the, the, the or the carceral um, state. We've had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of generations without police or policing. Um, so the idea is to restore those ways and understandings. And we still have our elders. We still have our relationship with our natural environment and um, the, the spirit world on that basis that informs how we work together. You know, that question is answered um, very subjectively dependent upon the indigenous practices. Uh, for our folks, we have um, peacemaking, which uh, even today is actually formally integrated in the uh, judicial system on the Nebuchadnezzar or the Navajo Nation, but it's rooted in a traditional cultural practice of transformative and restorative justice. Uh, you know, when we address these issues, we address accountability and responsibility. We address, you know, what ways can we transform the transgressors, but also what ways can we restore um, those that have been harmed? Um, what, what kind of restoration is needed? Um, and so these are basic practices that are integral with our ways of being, um, but are extraordinarily challenging to maintain when our cultures are so fragmented and, and fractured and influenced uh, by um, such toxic uh, um, uh, social practices as police policing um, and um, uh, imprisonment. Uh, and so this, this idea of punitive um, uh, action um, is, is something that I think has really poisoned our approaches um, but something that we can also heal from. So, you know, it's, 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 um, it's hard to imagine a future where our people would benefit um, from uh, what we currently see as a trajectory of uh, society based on police policing and incarceration. Um, you know, if we look at the statistics and they could keep growing, that means we have no future in police uh, policing and incarceration. Um, so we have to really critically look at the tools that we have um, and, and, and the, um, the ways of being and the ways of working with each other. Um, and that means restoring our cultural practices 
uh, and, and it's, it's not something that we need to imagine. It's not something that we need to um, uh, go too far back on. It's something that existed uh, and still is an intact in many communities. It could be through our matriarchal societies and, and, and ensuring that they're intact, uh, restoring um, that power uh, and, and, and uh, ensuring that the, the practices that go with accountability and responsibility, uh, transformation and restoration occur um, within that as well. And so those frameworks exist. Um, it's just a question of reconnecting with them. You know, it's not something that's linear. It's something that's cycle or secular, secular and something that we can reconnect to that cycle. Well, it, I mean, we can't reform the police just like we can't decolonize the police. Um, there's a lot of calls for police accountability, uh, but we don't want a kinder, gentler form of oppression. We want to be free. And so that means abolishing police. It means abolishing uh, the carceral state. It means uh, in ensuring that we um, develop um, uh, dual power and, and alternative systems at the same time or restore those alternative systems for justice in our communities um, that are actually just not based on uh, that, that aren't just solely punitive um, or not separate from uh, the, the terms that would be established and informed culturally as well. You know, our traditional cultural knowledge is very powerful uh, and can provide the framework for healing in our communities. We just have to empower that uh, and, and, and reconnect to that. And so um, I think another um, uh, issue that we come up against is that, especially indigenous communities, there's a lot of co-optation of uh, Black Lives Matters, like with the hashtag Native Lives Matters. You know, we can, we can be better that. We don't need to co-opt uh, a unique, powerful, uh, historical uh, moment and movement, um, but you know, we can proclaim Native Justice Now. It's, uh, there's a website, nativejusticenow.org, um, that is addressing that co-optation uh, and, and recognizing that we have a unique um, uh, opportunity as indigenous people to basically join in the rallying cry. Because when we say uh, Native Lives Matters or Native Justice Now and Black Lives Matters, ultimately what we're saying is the same thing, that we want to abolish the white supremacist police state um, and we want justice for our people. Uh, we don't want our people to you know, be murdered anymore in the streets by agents of the state. Uh, and so this is really the rallying uh, calls need to be honored. Um, we have our own songs, just as the, 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 the black communities have their own songs, and we don't need to perpetuate anti-blackness by co-opting um, those slogans, because it's more than just a hashtag. It's more than a slogan. It's a moment. It's a movement. And there's deep history, and there's uh, a lot of meaning that is, is put into that. And so I think what we need to do is, uh, of course, always go beyond um, uh, these uh, hierarchies of oppression recognize that we have the common enemy and, and, and fight against that. And that's what the Black Panthers and AIM did in their inception. You know, AIM, the American Indian Movement, was initially established as cop watch. Uh, so there's a deep history of uh, recognizing the violence of the state, uh, recognizing the need not just for accountability, but to uh, uh, go beyond these calls for reform. Like, you know, we don't want um, the police to be equipped with body cameras as a form of accountability because we know that doesn't work. Uh, they, the, the police in Winslow, when they murdered uh, L'Oreal Sinigini, Diné woman and mother, uh, in cold blood, put um, uh, multiple bullets uh, in her body, um, uh, they had a body camera on, you know, so, so creating this, 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 this false sense of uh, accountability, it's really just an extension of surveillance uh, and, and, and uh, PR relations uh, for law enforcement when the reality is, is that um, we have existed uh, with each other uh, in, in accountable and just ways before policing, and we can continue to do that uh, at, when we abolish police and when, when they're gone. So it's critical to understand what their laws are. Uh, and a lot of folks frame that as knowing your rights. Um, but their laws have been imposed on us, just like when uh, we're going to pray on our sacred lands and then we're charged for trespassing. Uh, the reality is, is that 
you know, we're never trespassing in our, our sacred lands. And so, uh, of course, that argument doesn't really hold up in court. I know because I've tried to make it. Um, but in the court of the colonizers, we know what their terms are. We know what the limitations of our assertions could potentially be. But it's important to empower ourselves to understand their laws so we can assert them in any interaction. And I don't necessarily believe in, in you know, nonviolent direct action, de-escalation tactics. Sometimes we need to strategically escalate and assert and confront, um, but also obviously be smart about it. Um, understanding that, you know, when you're going to a demonstration, you don't want to carry dangerous objects or, you know, uh, certain substances that might catch you more charges. Understand what how the system operates. Study it. Uh, understand how um, the court system uh, operates, the so-called uh, uh, justice system operates. Um, and, and that way it, you, you demystify that. Um, and uh, many of our, our folks already understand it because we've been um, uh, survivors of it. Uh, but uh, it's, it's, it can be very frightening, can be um, challenging. Uh, there can be a lot of fear and it can be very disempowering um, when we go to these actions, when we go through uh, demonstrations in, in, in different express different forms of resistance and we become targeted because uh, in many cases people become disempowered because they become isolated. So I think we need to have um, more concrete uh, forms of culturally based jail, jail solidarity, uh, more ways of supporting um, those inside uh, uh, from the out uh, to make sure that folks either if they're doing long term time or if they're doing e even just going through, you know, misdemeanor uh, charges that there is that that support and connection to culture and community um, uh, through the whole process. So that way, um, when they come out, it's not just a, a linear process and they're spit back and then they, pr they, they s are subjected to more uh, capitalist and colonial violence, um, but they're reconnected uh, to community, reconnected uh, to the culture, to, to the culture um, and uh, there is an understanding of ways that we can continue to grow um, our resistance uh, towards liberation. And so, um, you know, understanding their laws, uh, preparing ourselves, because if this is a battle, if this is really war, um, we have to engage on those terms and be prepared um, for the certain sacrifices that come to that. But we don't need to discard, we don't need to dispose, we don't need to isolate, um, but support, stand, and be smart about um, what we do. Not every action needs to be strategic, but if we think things through uh, and understand how their system operates, what their laws are, what the, the limitations are, then we can engage more tactically and hopefully more effectively. Uh, I mean, we, we have to also understand that we're operating in a new political environment uh, and we have um, not only state or federal entities um, that we have to go up against, but we also have private security forces that are basically paramilitary forces that um, enforce the, the interests of uh, corporations uh, and in, in many cases interface um, very um, uh, clearly with law enforcement entities of the state. And so those, those forces can um, uh, be a lot more um, uh, uh, dangerous. So we have to recognize those forces like Tiger Swan uh, up in Standing Rock. We have to recognize those private security forces um, where people have trained, you know, as paramilitaries, or maybe they come from military backgrounds and they um, uh, they get jobs at these private security forces uh, protecting corporate interests, um, like at what we saw at Standing Rock, um, or we see the extreme escalation of uh, the the militarization of law enforcement entities, where they're bringing out um, militarized weapons. Uh, uh, and so we have to be prepared for that and understanding the new political environment that we're operating in. Uh, I, I mean, just um, uh, since 2006, we've seen with the escalation of the Green Scare and the targeting of um, uh, environmental um, uh, advocates as eco-terrorists, um, our people have always been treated that same that, that way. But escalation of terrorism enhancement charges is something that we have to consider now in relation to the resistance work that we're doing. So being smart about understanding our law, uh, uh, our, our um, 
being smart about understanding the ways that the state operates, uh, the new ways that the state operates, what its capabilities are, uh, and thinking through our actions and being as responsible as possible, uh, and not succumbing to the fear, not you know recognizing that our culture is stronger um, than and, and has is more powerful than that and will carry us forward, uh, even if um, some of our relatives are facing a serious time. But we got to be there uh, with them because as long as someone is uh, incarcerated, then none of us are free.